Well, good day to you and welcome back to the channel. I periodically get questions asked of me about thermal typewriters and how to fix them, especially pertaining to the keyboards where some of the keys don't happen to work. And I've actually had this problem on several of my thermal typewriters and I've been able to fix, I think, all of them thus far. So this is a great opportunity actually since I was just last week taking type samples of all of my typewriters in my collection for the typewriter database run by Ted Monk. Check that out. In the process of doing so I wanted to get a type sample for the Canon Type Star 4 here and I noticed that the number 5 key wasn't working or you have to hit it really hard to make it register and so I thought self I'm gonna have to dig into this take the keyboard apart and fix the problem so I think that's what we're going to do. Stay tuned. Well, if you're a newcomer to typewriters and are unfamiliar with them, you could kind of classify them in several different categories. One of them are overall manual typewriters. These are finger operated. You have standards, medium sized portables, and lightweight portables, or what we sometimes call ultra portables. And then we have electrified typewriters. These are basically like manual typewriters. They use type bars, but they have an electric motor that assists. And in the category of electric typewriter, you could also say the IBM Selectrics are also electric. They don't have electronics, they just have a motor. Even though they don't have type bars, they have a type element. And then there are electronic typewriters, and you can generally put those into two categories. One of those are the so-called daisy wheel uh, typewriters. They use a plastic print wheel and they have electronics that control the stepper motors. And then there are thermal typewriters. And that's what this is. The Canon Type Star 4 is one example of it. They're called thermal because they originally had a ribbon cartridge that fits in here on the print head and it uses a plastic based ribbon cartridge with a film that gets transferred to the paper by heating it up with a thermal print head. So a thermal print head pushes the ribbon against the paper. The heat of the element makes the figure you're trying to print and that transfers the coating on the film to the normal regular paper. Most of these typewriters came out in the 1980s. There are some that were made in the 1990s, but the cartridges for decades have been out of manufacture and and there are some new old stock ones available on the used market, but they're very pricey. So what most people have done is to take the cartridges out and use thermal paper directly. And that's what I've been doing. Either the rolls of fax paper, or you can also get letter size sheets of thermal paper. So these are really nice typewriters for typing late at night in environments where you need to be really quiet. That's how I like to use them. But one of the problems with these, because they're so old, they're from the 1980s, they're electronic, they have a microcontroller and a circuit board, and they have ribbon cables and stepper motors, and it gets kind of intricate. But in this case, the problem is the keyboard. Well, before we get started here, I wanted to put the machine down on a soft towel. I have a towel I like to use. And secondly, if there is a ribbon cartridge in your machine, remove the cartridge. And then, on the other side, on the bottom side, open up the battery compartment and take out any batteries that you might have. And then you're going to want to pull off both platen knobs and set those aside, keeping in mind that the right-hand knob is the longer of the two, the left-hand knob is the shorter of the two. Okay, then on the front side again, there are two screws here that we're going to remove, and underneath the ribbon cover there is two screws here. They are technically not Phillips, they are JIS or Japanese Industrial Society, but if you find the right size Phillips screwdriver it should work for you. Alright, so now you might notice that the top shell feels like it's trying to come off. If you kind of maneuver it around the edges on the sides, then you can get the top shell just to come off completely like that. Okay, so we have the whole transport mechanism for the paper. There is a stepper motor right here that operates the feed for the paper that actually moves the platen. And then the print head here has its own stepper motor here that this motor drives the print head back and forth on this metal rod 
right, the drive rod, and then there's going to be another stepper motor underneath the printhead mechanism that actually drives the printhead into the paper and back out. But what we want to do is remove this keyboard. It just lifts off, it mounts onto these four studs, two studs here and two holes here. The keyboard lifts off and you'll notice, if I'm showing you carefully, there is a ribbon cable right here that goes onto the circuit board. Okay, so this ribbon cable that connects into the motherboard of the computer, this ribbon cable just pulls straight up. Start from one end and it removes like that right off the connector. And just remember that when you put it back that you have to put it down like that. The ribbon does not twist like a Moeba strip. It just goes straight over. Okay, next is I have all of these screws. They're usually sealed up with some kind of adhesive. I'm basically going to take all those screws out. Okay, all of these screws were the same kind. Okay, now between that circuit board and the keyboard is a light connector. And you just want to put a, put a, a thin screwdriver in there and pry the connector off. The connector has pins right there and it fits into the socket. So this is our number five key, the one that's giving us trouble, and it's the sixth key over from the left on the top row. And if we turn it over, it's going to be this key right here. And it corresponds to this row on the circuit board. So here's our white connector that plugs into here. It's the sixth one over from this side which is this one here. And the way these work is kind of interesting. So what you have on each keypad on the circuit board are two sets of bare foil traces that kind of encircle one another. And they're not touching each other until something conductive bridges across them and makes the connection. There is a rubber membrane underneath this keyboard inside the frame of each key. This one that I'm pointing at here. That is a little rubbery nib and it has a black coating on it that's conductive and when this the flat surface of that round nib touches those foil traces on that board it makes them conduct together which tells the microcomputer hey you just press the number five key so looking at this particular thing I see and you may not be able to see it but I see some little specks of something or other on this key right here. And I want to clean those off, but I also want to check the conductivity. I'm going to take an ohm meter. I'm going to touch either side of this surface to see if there's, it should read some kind of conductivity. So I'm going to try to bridge across these two without actually touching the meter leads together. And I'm reading about 108 ohms. Let's see here. 150, depends on how hard you touch it. Let me read the one next to it. That's about the same. So I'm going to guess that those two little specks of grit on the keypad might be the cause of our problem of it not being detecting contact. So I'm going to take a little bit of isopropyl alcohol and I'm going to just clean that keycap. And I don't want to wipe off any of the black coating on it, which generally doesn't come off, but just be gentle with it. I'm going to dry it with the other side of my Q-tip, and now I want to check for continuity again on that little pad and make sure it's conductive. Yeah, it's conductive. And, but that's not all, but wait, there's more. I'm going to take the circuit board, and I'm also going to clean those bare foil traces the sixth one over from the left is this one. It looks clean. You know, and while you're at it, you might want to just knock them all, hit them all. So before I put this back together and test it, I just want to look at all the other little pads. Even though I wasn't having problems with any of the others uh, in actual operation, I want to look and see if there's any of them that look like they have a little bit of speck of grit on them. So I'm just looking at all these, make sure they look clean. I'm really hesitant to wipe them all unnecessarily because the conductive coating on these rubber pads is very fragile. 
Okay, so now I'm going to put this back together and test it. So we have the white male connector, the white female connector. You want to line those up very precisely. Get those pins lined up. Press the connector together like that. Looks nice and straight. And now I want to put in all my screws in, every one of them, because they could be securing a ground plane or a ground connection on the other side of the board. You don't want to have any of these loose. So uh, what I generally do is I put each of them in loose, not totally tight. That way the board has room to move around slightly so you can get the rest of the screws in easily. You'll notice the original sealing on these screws, they had like some bluish green glue holding these in. It was clear that they did not want these screws to come loose. And the, probably the reason why they were concerned about that is because underneath each of these screws might be a ground point that gets grounded to the chassis or to some point on the circuit board. And if that ground comes loose or that connection comes loose on the screw, it'll cause you all kinds of problems. So after we get all of the screws in loose, we're going to tighten them up really good before we test the machine. Okay, now I'm just going to start from one end to the other and tighten all these really good. Now if you haven't serviced your machine before, you'll probably find it's really dirty inside. Well, I'm going to be cleaning mine if it needs it, but I want to make sure and test the work I did first before we go any further. So this is the way the keyboard sits in the machine. If you just flip it over, you can see now the cable has to fit into that connector. And so you just, there's a slot in there. You want to be very delicate. This is probably the most delicate thing you'll do to this machine. Get the cable lined up and push it down in there so that all those little metal pins or metal parts of the ribbon cable seat themselves properly. Like that. Now I'm just going to place the keyboard back on its mounting point like that. And at this point, um, I can actually test it. I'm going to run this off of 6 volt DC, the, the DC adapter that it came with. It's going to be a lot more convenient than trying to use batteries. The 6 volt connector is over on the right side. Turn on the power switch. Hey, things move. Okay. Hey, look at that. My fives. It works. So now is a good time to clean the machine, re-lubricate these little plastic gears with lithium grease very lightly. This metal bar that the printhead mechanism runs back and forth on, you want to clean that very good with alcohol and cotton buds and then put a really super thin film of lithium grease on it just to give it some lubrication. Make sure all of the dirt and grit is out of this plastic track here that the printhead rides on. All of that has to be very clean. The gears here that run the platen forward and backwards. I'm going to put the top shell back in place so the chassis is seated on its mounting posts right here, the keyboard part. And I want to just press the plastic shell back in, make sure it seals up on the sides. And then I have my four screws to put back in, the two here and the two back here. All right, get my knobs put back on in the right order. And this one just has a D-shaped hole like that. So this is your push and variable, and this is just the non-variable clicker. Okay, so let's get a fresh piece of thermal paper and let's test this machine, shall we? This was actually a relatively easy keyboard to get into and to work on and to fix. In this case, this problem was just two tiny little specks of grit that were on the front surface of that rubber pad, keeping it from making full contact with those two circuit board traces, because it, it has to bridge across the two sets of traces to make the contact.
Well, anyways, that came out pretty well. Easier than I thought it was going to be. Sometimes these things can be real nightmares, but the Canon Type Star 4 is pretty easy to get into. Just be careful, put everything back the way it was, and if you're working on it for the first time, it's probably never been worked on in, since it was made, you're going to find it really dirty, so take your time, clean all the dirt out. If the old grease and lubricants are hardened up, clean all that out with alcohol and cotton buds, and then put some new lithium grease in there and you'll be good to go. I wasn't going to show you actually about the lubrication and cleaning part of it. This is more about how to repair the keyboards and really how to take the machine apart. But if you have any questions, drop a note down below. I'd love to talk to you about thermal typewriters, and until next time, stay creative. Have yourselves a great day, and bye-bye for now.